Good morning und Hallöchen and welcome to the most exciting, maybe final installment of the Silly Pillow series. The one where we slap a few textures on our pillow, load in an HDR and call this one done. So let's do that and for shading this, I would like to have UV coordinates on it. And usually my UV coordinates should have been created up here in the grid, which posed the problem because you'd have to re-simulate the whole thing. And if you're lazy like me, that is not really appealing. So what can we do about this? Well, let's have a look at this file cache on this very first frame as this geometry is pretty flat. So what we could do is drop down a time shift node, wire this in after the file cache and have this set to be fixed on frame one. So no matter on which frame I am in the timeline, this will always return frame one of a simulation. So after this, let's attach a UV texture and this by default is set up as we want it, projecting orthographic UV coordinates along the Y axis onto this grid here. Let's visualize this using a UV quick shade. Yeah, that's working fine. So down here where we load in our simulated geometry and transform it using the technique we talked about last tutorial. Now I want to apply the same UV coordinates that we have on the vertices in this stream here. If you middle mouse on this, you can see we have the UV set as a vertex attribute. I want to bring those over down here into our stream. In my case, I'm gonna use a vertex wrangle I'll attach down here, wire in my stream with the UV coordinates in the second input slot here, and use a short expression to bring over the UV coordinates using the vertex expression, which works really similarly to the point expression. So we're looking up our vertices on our second input slot, one with the ID one, looking for the attribute UV. And then we want to look up the attribute on the same vertex on the second stream as the one vertex we are working on the first stream. So that's at VTX now. And now if we middle mouse on this, we now have a vertex attribute called UV here. Let's drag down this quick shade, wire this up and highlight it. And yes, we can see these coordinates come over neatly and they animate and deform in a manner that looks correct to me. Okay, let's just attach a null, call this one out, highlight it. Let's drag this over and for lighting, shading, rendering, I wanna close those tabs here, pinning this one tab, hitting control T twice, creating those three tab. I'll set one, two out, that's where I set up the rendering and one, two mat, that's where I'll set up the materials. Okay, back to our geo context, wanna get up one level. So that's where I'm working. I'm gonna be using redshift for this, control clicking on the camera to create a camera at the current viewport position. Also, I wanna lock this to my viewport so it moves around when I navigate in the viewport. Next, by control clicking on the RS light dome, I'll create just that, a light dome. And in here, under the light tab, I'm gonna load in a dome map, which is an HDR, which I downloaded, link in the description. For later, what I did, I corrected the gamma and dialed back the saturation to only 30%. Let's skip to some later frame and simulation. Maybe have a look at this from the side or maybe even use the four split view and set this to be wireframes, like so. I'm gonna create a, another grid as a ground plane, which I'll move down accordingly, something like this. I think I'm gonna scale this a bit bigger and I'll dive in here and increase the grid's resolution to say 40 by 40, because for this grid, I wanna use a gradient, which might depend on the UV attributes interpolation. So I'd rather have a better resolution for my UV attributes, which I'm creating now using again, the UV texture node, which by default is set up correctly for my liking. Finally, let's attach normals. And that's that for the geo creation for my background. Let's call this one BG. Move it over here. Let's create materials, starting by dropping down a Redshift material builder diving in there and we're going to create the background material here. So I want to drag this down and drop down a ramp, which I'll set to be radial. And this one goes into the diffuse color. On the material itself, I'll just decrease the reflection to zero so that this isn't reflecting at all. And in here in the ramp, let's dial in a few nice colors. In my case, maybe adding a few points and going for something rather pinkish here to a blue and then to an orange yellowish kind of color. In my OBJ level, let's assign this material to a background in the render tab here, just select it like so. Well, let's move our camera to the top of this like so, maybe a bit asymmetrically framed. And also in our camera, what I wanna do in the view tab is I want to adjust the focal length because currently longer focal length are kind of in fashion. So no Insta likes without a longer focal length. In my case, I'm going with a moderately sized 85 millimeters. Okay, move this back a bit. Let's save this, hit our redshift icon up here. And in the out tab, let's adjust our settings here. Just going to the Redshift tab to the global illumination and enabling Brute Force and Brute Force S primary and secondary GI engines. All right, back to our OBJ level. Let's maybe save this and hit our render view button. All right, not too bad. I've got my gradient in the back. The overall look is a bit dark and less contrasty and not too saturated, but we're gonna adjust that. Let's just first build the shader for this pillow. Stop this, maybe take a snapshot and minimize this. So in my material context, let's go up one level, call this shader maybe BG for background and create another Redshift material builder. Call this one pillow. 
dive in there. And in here, I'm gonna start out with a material preset, namely silver, which is highly reflective. So let's just assign this one to our pillow. Again, in the rendering tab, just selecting the material, saving this and in my render view, let's just restart the rendering, which already looks kind of promising. So let's keep this open and dial in our material properties here. So currently this reflection is a bit blurry, which is what you dial in here in the roughness slider. And also if we drag this down here, we can see that the reflectivity is set to about 95, 96 and 99% respectively. So if we crank this up, we're getting more what looks like a perfectly mirror-like reflection, which is physically not plausible, but as we're working on a stylized rendering, why not roll with this? However, as it currently stands, this is interesting, but I'd like to be my reflection in the material to be a bit more colorful, for which I'm gonna use a noise, which I'll then pipe through a ramp node to color it. And in Redshift, there are two types of noises, the standard default Redshift noises offering the traditional classic CG noises such as Worley or Perlin. And for a few releases now, there are also the Maxon noises, which are comp noises consisting out of these base noises just layered on top of each other, giving you a bit of more variety to choose from. So why not use the Maxon noise here and wire this in the reflection color. So now we can see the noise coming through here. And in the Maxon noise node, I can select from those really weirdly named noises. So let's take one with a very, very silly name, the Stupo, resulting in this type of noise here. Let's dial this in. And the only thing I want to do here is increase its overall scale to four. And in contrast to Redshift's noises, the scale works as a scale multiplier, not as a repetitions multiplier here. So that's a bit weird. Also, for later, I want to layer this with a copy of this noise that's been scaled to add a bit more detail. So again, very same noise, just this time scaled to two, like so. Gonna use a mix color to mix both. So my noise is going to input one and input two respectively, and the mix output goes into the reflection color here. And now I can dial in at which percentage, which of the scaled versions of the noise is showing through. In my experiments, a value of 0 0.2, so 80% of this first noise and 20% of the second noise gave me good results. Let's color these noises using a ramp. Just goes in here. Let's drag this down, add another point, maybe at 70% and add in a few colors. Maybe something really poppy, something like this. And I've only got very few areas in which the red actually comes through. So let's see if we can dial in something in the noise color correction here, adjusting its contrast a bit. So now these reddish areas come through a bit better. And I think I left them pretty subtle at a value of 0.1. Same goes for the second noise. However, I've been using the high clip value of the second noise to also bring back a bit of detail in here setting this to a really, really low value of this. Now this color palette isn't to my liking. This is too much in the red, green, yellowish area. And I could just dial in those three values of my ramp. However, in of itself, I find those colors matching. It's just, I don't like their hue. So I'm being lazy again and using a color correct down here. Just wired in after the ramp to shift the hue to my liking. In my case, shifting it 140 degrees. However, I want those structured, noisy, colorful areas only to show through in certain areas of my geometry here. So I'll use a color mix again, wiring in my corrected color here in the second input slot and setting the main color that I want to have otherwise to, I think I did something like this, maybe like so. And to drive the whole mix amount, and let's just wire this up into the reflection color first, to drive the amount where this kind of purplish color appears and where the noise appears, I use a Fresnel. So let me just wire in the Fresnel into the surface output so we can see exactly what's happening here. So using the Fresnel, we are getting high values at those edges here. And I unchecked using XF refraction and instead used the curve fall off set to a low value of one to blend between those two colors. So I used the output color as the mix amount in my color mix. Let's wire in my final material again, resulting in something like this. And to precisely dial in the mix amount happening here, I dialed in the facing and perpendicular colors of my Fresnel, setting my facing color, I think to 0 0.3 and my perpendicular color to 0 0.75. Okay, still a bit grayish here, which largely is due to the exposure. However, I want to do another thing and wire in the color I just created into my coding, code color and code reflectivity. And in my material, I want to dial in two different reflectivities, one on my base material and one for my coding. So for my base material, I'll increase the roughness to 0 0.3 which gives me this nice fall off of rough silvered plastic. However, on top of this, I want to add a bit more gloss, which usually comes from the top coating. So in my coating slot here, I'll increase my coat weight to one 
leaving the roughness at zero. So now you can see we're getting those really sharp reflections mixed in here. And instead of the IOR, I'm gonna use the color, which I already wired up here. And then I'd like to dial back its weight a tiny bit so it's not as pronounced. And I get the feeling that this coating is too colorful. So before we pipe those colors into the coating slots here, let's add another color correction after the color mix. And then this goes into those two slots here. And in here, I'm just gonna dial back the saturation scale to 50% like so. It's just a detail, but for some reason, when I set this up, it was important to me. So you might want to do it, you might not, but that's what I stuck with. All right, let's save this and work on the exposure here. Let's zoom out a bit, move this over. Most of the time when I'm working, I'm just plainly stupidly using Redshift's camera tag here, enabling the photographic exposure. And in this case, after a bit of fiddling around, I arrived at the following values. I increased the ISO to 160. I allowed for a bit of overexposure, eh, maybe more like this. I even increased the saturation by 10% to make it even more super saturated. And in the post effects, I added a LUT, which hide in this folder, the program data, redshift data and LUT. In this case, I'm gonna select a Portra 800, giving this a bit more contrast. Then I enabled bloom, dialing down this bloom threshold so we can actually see something happening here. And I think I set it to 1.8. And I was feeling adventurous, so I enabled the streaks as well, increasing the streak tail a good bit and decreasing the streak threshold to 1.22. Finally, what I did is I think I tweaked the background colors a bit to be a tiny bit less saturated, but these are the general base settings with which I proceeded rendering and went ahead and applied final minimal tweaks. So let's have a look at the shader graph again. Nothing overly complicated, just a few layered noises, a ramp to colorize those, and then a few color mixes and color corrections to create the desired hue that we want. The only thing worth mentioning here might be the layering of a base and coating, which is what usually happens in most real world materials, at least those that we deal with in our daily life. And that's it for rendering. And maybe also for the silly pillow. Let's see if we do some add-on tutorials to this, but I hope you had fun. It definitely has been a very enjoyable project for me. And if you wanna learn more about in-depth Houdini stuff using our courses on Patreon, you might wanna support us over there. And to everyone supporting us already, thanks so much, guys. With a very, very special thank you to Patrick Fillion, Important Looking Pirates, Rafik Anadol, and Chris Hebert. Thanks so much, guys. So until next time, it's cheers and goodbye.